William, your videographer from Two Hats Publishing. I welcome you to the College of Complexes, recorded live in downtown Lakewood area, nestled gently against White Rock Lake. Downtown Lakewood is home to the restaurants with family values and family history to match. Visit the Mecca Restaurant at the corner of Skillman Avenue and Live Oak and tell them you want your reservation to the next College of Complex class. Welcome to the College of Complex. This is our 202nd meeting since, uh, since we began here in Jan February of 2009. We put a different speaker on every week, a different subject. We require speakers to take a position on an issue, express a point of view. We give an hour to make a presentation. If they go over an hour, we cut them off. If anybody interrupts the speaker, remind the interrupter we're going to listen one fool at a time. After our speaker is complete his presentation. We have questions and answers, not speeches. Then we have remarks, rebuttals. Everybody in the audience has five minutes at the podium to respond to the speaker said for or against. Then the speaker gets the last word. He gets a comment and a comment and close the meeting. That's how, the, that's how this thing works. And that's where we go from here. Um, now we have a, it was brought to our attention at the uh, Mecca Restaurant Management uh, following our last meeting that over of 30 people who attended only 13 ordered food and that some people had brought their own food to the restaurant and it was the desire of the restaurant management to terminate our use of their facility after much discussion the restaurant had agreed to a charge of five dollars explaining that it was uh, anyone at, at attending our event this would be a minimum they also agreed to put on two waitresses to give to to help out with this we're supposed to have two waitresses today anyway this means that you must order something that would exceed five dollars you'll be charged accordingly hopefully this would serve to restore our credibility for for a strong and lasting tenure well today we were notified that uh that's not true. Uh, they want to charge $5 on top of everything else. So, which is not, not a good thing. And uh, I told them so. And it, we're getting nowhere, so this will be the last week we're here. Right. Anyway, we thought there'd be a happy arrangement putting a $5 minimum on there. That would, that would be the end of it. Because people would bring their own food and they'd order something. As soon as they saw it was $5, they'd order something, you know. But that, uh, that isn't, they're not satisfied. I got the mic and I think I already said everything. Say it again. I wound up ordering a, a $4 ball of oatmeal even though I ate my dinner meal so I could add that with my two bucks for coffee yeah. and be a dollar over their minimum. Right. Which means I'm already down between $14 and $15 before I leave a tip. Counting the three tuition, the five cash, yeah. and now six and a half dollars for a cup of coffee or a ball of oatmeal. I'm down. That's between $14 and $15 before I leave a tip. Yeah. You know? It's crazy. I agree. That's why we're not going to be here next week. Uh, no, Al. <laughs> Let's have a duel. What about, <laughs> what about the $5 being mandated as tips to the wait staff spread equally? Oh, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. But we ain't going to be here anyway. We're not going to be here, but that's a good idea. Now, I, I would like to make an announcement, Susan. I, uh, I've been making this announcement each week for a while. November 17th, I'm going to be doing a crop walk for hunger. First of all, I'd like to thank those people that have contributed so far. But I will be asking each time if uh, I'm trying to raise about $200 myself. Uh, but the crop walk is for hunger. 20% will remain in the local area. Basically, I'm in Mesquite and Garland and in Dallas, and it will go to food banks there. The rest of it will be spread for world hunger. And uh, the crop walk, uh, neighbors walking together to take a stand against hunger in our, our world. Different ages, faiths, backgrounds. Together we raise awareness and funds 
for international relief and development, as well as local hunger fighting. Some 2,000 communities across the country take part in this each year. And basically, it's a faith-based thing also with many of the, is my too loud for you? Yes. Well, I'll just try to keep it low. <laughs> Am I okay for you, Al? <laughs> okay, very good, very good. So anyway, uh, what does it uh, take to, to hold a walk? Well, it just takes people to go out there and walk. And it, mine is uh, our Savior Lutheran Church in Mesquite. I'll be walking with those people. And it'll be held November 17th on a Sunday. Now, they're happening all across the country uh, to fight hunger. Now, here's what some of the things do. What difference, and, and we're walking 10K. And the point is, why do we walk 10K? Because it's a nice round number. No. <laughs> Basically, what it is, is most of the people in, in developing countries have to walk at least 10K for their water, sometimes their food, and so forth. And it is, uh, we do have a world hunger problem for those that care. But anyway, what difference, uh, $75 can enable three women to attend a literacy class for a year and change their lives forever. A hundred, this is just a listing of what the money can do. 110 can provide emergency food supplies for a family of five, uh, five needs for a month. $140 can give a struggling farm family a new resource of income. A pair of pigs, a piglet from each litter is then given to another family in need. And uh, $350, and this isn't saying that that's what we want from you, unless you're rich, and if the Koch brothers are here, I would like their money. Uh, uh, can enable 350 the eldest in the child headed household of AIDS orphans t to receive vocational training so they can support their siblings and themselves. So anyway, this, this goes to uh, a good cause. And if, if we don't think that uh, the world hunger is our problem, it is to anybody that has a heart. Thank you very much. And again, I thank those that have already contributed and those that haven't, I'm um, available. Thank you. The organization, the Activists for Truth and Liberty, are putting on two presentations. One tomorrow evening is, and I'll have to send it to you so you can send it to people, but it's out at the um, corner of Bethany and 75. And it's Jim Mars speaking on both the Kennedy assassination and the Federal Reserve. <clears throat> yeah, he's very good. I think that's about 7 o'clock tomorrow evening, so I'll, I'll get you the details on it. <clears throat> and the second one is on the 28th, which I think is Monday, <clears throat> a Monday, the uh, Moriarty's, Jimmy and Joanne Moriarty's are speaking again. They've been here to Dallas already. They were on the ground in Libya to see the truth about what happened, and everything we got in the news is 180 degrees the opposite of the truth. And they are whistleblowers. Uh, because they were there, because they knew what they knew, <clears throat> the United States government, they're American citizens, the embassy would not even talk to them when they wanted to get out of there to save their lives. Uh, Al-Qaeda had been paid to kill them they had $19,000 in their pocket and bought them off at the last minute and got through that. They only got out by going to uh, European Union countries and getting out through one of the, uh, uh, <clears throat> I guess the European Union has an embassy that's in common now. That got them out, but they got back here and they had performed on them what is called a soft kill. That is where everything in your life is pulled out from under you. They lost their $700 million business, their home. No one will give them a job, even Burger King, because the government's watching them, and if they go apply for a job, that person gets talked to. 
And I know this is true because on a much lesser scale, but not lesser for my life, I had exactly the same thing happen to me when I learned certain things in an area that most of this group would never believe in. But I had a friend who <clears throat> became a friend because he did a file on me for the NSA and then wanted to meet me. And I later found out about that by asking him. Uh, another friend had introduced us saying, you know, you, me you remember that guy you met down in Belize on that trip you took down there a few years ago? And I said, no, I don't remember that guy at all. He said, well, y'all bumped into each other at the hotel there you were in. <clears throat> and anyway, I saw him the other day and he wants, he'd like to get together with us. So I'm curious and I said yes. And we had dinner with the person I had never seen in my life. But I liked him. He liked me. Uh, he became a friend. He still is a friend. I saw him last year down in Tarpon Springs, Florida. And uh, during the years I was practicing law, I took him through a <clears throat> very difficult divorce. And when I was in Florida, he informed me that his wife's mother came to him during that divorce and said, <clears throat> my daughter and her boyfriend have plotted to kill you. I mean, what? Oh, yeah. And uh, so anyway, <clears throat> I knew that his brother was a general in the Air Force in charge of uh, electronic intelligence in the Pentagon. So one day, now Val had moved up to uh, Georgia. Uh, I called him up on the phone. We talk frequently. <clears throat> and I said, would you ask your brother a hypothetical question for me? And he said, sure, what is it? I said, well, the question is, if there is any truth to the subject of UFOs and aliens, and if the government is involved with them in any way, and if someone wanted to work in that area, would it be possible and how would they go about it? Now, naive little me didn't realize that that was a formal job application, which meant extreme scrutiny of my entire past and probably generations beyond that, I don't know. Uh, I know they went all the way up into Illinois and interviewed neighbors I'd never met, <coughs> but at that time I was the vice president of the local MUFON group, Mutual UFO Network, pain in the behind the government because they're constantly filing Freedom of Information Act claims and uh, getting back pages that are all blacked out or largely blacked out from the government and they're going out to all the different sightings and interviewing people and so forth. So the government doesn't like these people because this is of extreme priority to cover up. Okay, so then I got back with him a week or so later and I said, did you ask George that question? He said, I sure did and the minute I got the term UFO out of my mouth, he intervened and he said, uh, George, uh, Abval, we're not going to talk about that on the phone. I'll see you in a couple of weeks and we'll talk about it privately. Well, in the meantime, <clears throat> he moved down to Marathon Island in the Keys. And so it was a couple of months later when I got back with him. And I said, did you ask George that question? He said, I sure did. And I said, well, is there anything to that subject? He said, Albert, there is more to that subject than you and I together could even imagine. I said, are they having contact? He said, yes, it's regular and it's been going on for a long time. He said, what I'll try to do is get my brother and you down here and we'll go out in a boat in the Gulf and turn off the motor and talk. Never happened. I was helping like John Gentry and John Seidler have been here before, videotape really out of the box lectures. A friend started an organization called the Eclectic Viewpoint, Cheyenne Turner. She brought in from England the guy who was uh, the leading expert on crop circles over there. And if you think two guys with boards mashing down weeds made crop circles, you know, what are you going to ask Santa Claus for this year? I mean, it's, it's impossible with our technology to make crop circles. We don't know how to do it. And uh, same with building the pyramids. We, all the technology today couldn't build the pyramids. I mean, there are a lot of things like that that are mysteries still. And so it came around towards Y2K, and here I am without a job now, and I'm thinking, well, what the heck can I do? Well, 30 years earlier, I had programmed in co the COBOL language with IBM as a computer systems engineer out in California. And so I thought, well, heck, yeah, I, I was a good programmer in COBOL, and that was the big issue, the two-digit date in COBOL. If you will remember, when it rolled over to the year 2000, the computer's going to think 1900, and the programs are going to blow up. And I realized that, and a friend of mine, classmate, who was also a, an SE with IBM, realized that, and we talked about it. We even went up to his cabin for Christmas and New Year's and, to wait out the, the big crash. 
And it, uh, this was funny, at, at midnight we got out on his porch, December the 31st, and we're looking across the valley to West Cliff with all the lights on, and at the stroke of midnight, the whole valley goes black. And we looked at each other and we thought, my God, it really happened. Well, some guy had been at a party and got drunk and hit a pole. <laughs> West Cliff, Colorado. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's time for this Y2K pressure and they're needing, according to the books and so forth, 750,000 COBOL programmers to solve the problem without a worldwide crash and you know they didn't have them. So I figured, oh heck, I can, I can do this. So I went out and bought some books on COBOL and figured out all the new instructions and techniques in the language for the last 30 years and boned up on it and went and took an exam and the guy said, well, it looks like you've been programming for the last five years. Yeah, I got jobs and I got one and I worked for about six months, put an extra 25 grand in the bank. So uh, anyway, uh, our speaker tonight had trouble getting here and he's finally here and uh, my wife was making bets. Anyway. Uh, Isaac Oglin, is it Oglin? All right. Ogin. He's a registered clinical staff pharmacist with Senti Corporation. He's going to discuss the Affordable Care Act. Obamacare is it here to stay? That's uh, all of you have uh, uh, itinerary in front of you. I don't want to waste your time or put you to sleep reading all this. Oh my God. So I just want to preface this by saying whoever created the freeways here in Dallas, um, they intentionally put us in this trap for which we will get ticketed and warranted and it's a long story. Um, I, had, I had some warrants, um, so they caught me and it's the worst week of my life. Um, but anyways, it's, it's, it's going to get a whole lot better. That's a, that's a topic for another day. But I want to specifically talk, and I just, I'm just going to give like a rough overview of, of my take on this and how it fits in with the larger piece and what this means economically for us. And, and kind of the way um, I, I approach things, because I do, I have my undergraduate degree in biochemistry, and I have my doctorate from the University of New Mexico. So when I look at things, I look at them in terms of systems, and I look at them in terms of balanced systems, and then we have this whole other science of um, unbalanced systems, or chaos theory. Um, and I kind of want to fuse a couple of biological and uh, uh, you know systems and how that relates to the free market and how balance in general should be how we handle things um, I was talking to some gentlemen the other day we had some great conversations it was here as a matter of fact and we talked about um, balance we talked about a strong liberal um, house and we talked about a strong conservative party it, the stronger they are the better but at the end of the day if you can meet compromise or something in the middle then you're gonna find balance and you're gonna achieve that um, a couple of things that I've seen just in the past, um, if we look through our history, we, we look at the stock market crash of 1929. We look at the stock market crash of 2010, roughly, approximately. And we look at how the system in those cases wasn't balanced. We had unfretted, laissez-faire, non-free market economics happening. And what, and what happened? Those systems crushed the entire global economy. As a matter of fact, we just recently witnessed one of the biggest economic threats that we've seen in a long time, that being the shutdown of the government and us possibly defaulting on our loans. The last time in our re most recent history that this happened was when Hitler became chancellor of Germany. The first thing he did was default on all of his loans. It, sent, it, cr it destroyed the German economic market, which if you're, an, if you're an anarchist or if you're one of those people over there on the fringe, you probably wanted this to happen and maybe some independents wanted it to happen. And it, that may not have been the way to go because then we would have started from scratch. We would have been vulnerable from, you know, um, you know attacks offshores and we would have been vulnerable to domestic attacks on our own people. That might not have been the, the wisest thing to do, but um, our fearless leader, Commander-in-Chief Obama is is brilliant and he handled the, ca the situation correctly. Now all we need to do is we need to get uh, Ted Cruz arrested for uh, disrupting uh, economic e commerce and hurting people because my family who serves in the military, 
was hurt immensely by this. Our economy lost $2.9 billion. We lost about 3% of growth that we were protected to have over the next 10 years, all because of this shutdown. But I don't wanna, I don't wanna name names or blame, because that's not what we do. We, we learn from our mistakes and we move forward. And that's how I view this. I view this as, as something that, that was education for us. We needed to see this because why? Now we get to talk about it. But my topic, off topic again, is, is uh, the Affordable Health Care Act. And it is Obamacare, and it can work. Over the past uh, recent years, um, we've seen three major industries take over the market, those being the insurance companies, those being the drug companies, and, and now the rise of what I call, quote unquote, the industrial hospital complex. And really what that means is when you have three markets controlling everything, you find collusion. You find it in gas, you find it in computers. You find it when um, Stephen Jobs supposedly, or Bill Gates supposedly had owned the market where his processors or his uh, software was being put on every computer that came out. It wasn't allowing anyone to compete with that. Well, right now we have, I'm a pharmacist, so I've seen 30 cent tablets, um, and if it's HIV or it's, you know, if it's HIV or if it's cancer or anything related to that or even something related to autoimmune diseases, they will mark up a 30 cent pill all the way up to probably 100 to 500 percent. And the reason why is because there's no competition. They have no one directly competing with them. So right now drug companies know this. Right now insurance companies know this. So they can charge whatever premium they want and it doesn't matter. What Obamacare is going to do and what the bill is designed to do is it's designed to break up this free market. It's actually designed to create a free market. So for anyone that's into a free market, then Affordable Health Care Act will help us. I want to uh, draw attention to a time when the system was chaotic. Let's go back to 1929. There wasn't any regulations. There weren't any rules. Things were unfretted and not working. And government, people say they, they don't like big government. Well, no one likes big government. Who likes big government? I don't like big government. I dealt with bureaucracy today. What I want is efficient government. So every dollar that I spend in tax money, I'm at the 35% tax bracket. I want each one of those dollars to be spent efficiently. The current system, and I'll just use an example of today, is not efficient. They spend big money and they spend big dollars and we have the right wing of the, the political party do this on purpose, because what they want you to see is that, it, that government can't work. But any government that's pulling in lots of money, like the Defense Department, who brings in one of, it's one of the most, the highest grossing sectors that we have, they're very efficient. They're very good with their money. But however, certain things that they want to get rid of, they add all these stipulations. They make us, they give, they give us the, the, you know, the, the guys that things are running inefficiently so that we can outsource that to a third party, like what we're seeing with our school system here. The, the fact is, is what Obamacare is supposed to do and what it will be designed to do is to break up these free markets. It's gonna allow, you're gonna start to see lots of commercials for companies like Molina, for companies like my company, which would be US Script, for companies like Express Scripts, from, from companies like CVS Caremark. You're gonna start to see them have to compete because now, they are going to have to compete. This makes for efficiency. So if you're, if you're paying your premiums to a, an insurance company, but the insurance company that's providing you the best service at the lowest premium, that company that does a good job on making us healthy, that's the company that's out gonna outcompete the other company. And they'll have to, based on price, as demand um, starts, uh, I don't know, so based on demand, those prices will actual, actually fluctuate on an open market that we haven't seen in a really long time. So if you wonder why, you know, these big, and I'm gonna talk about old money. Um, we're gonna talk about these old industries. They love the fact that they can set their own prices. They love it. Why would they wanna change that? They, did, they don't. So what would they do? Well, one way would be to infiltrate by buying another politician. That politician will probably force a government shutdown on us just to save billions of dollars, probably trillions of dollars, that are about to get transferred over to the rise of new money. And I put this specifically, this is related to my company. My company is a PBM, it's a pharmacy, uh, it's PBM is pharmacy benefits management. My job is to make, I work for Medicaid, my job is to make efficient use of my money. So every time I go into a case and I decide something, I think of a couple of things. One is my, the economic impact that it's gonna have on us. 
If this is a if this is a short term situation that we're treating as a short term situation, then we're not going to do okay. But if we look at the longer picture of things and how this will play out, then I'm ab able to make a better decision. That saves us money. That saves you tax dollars. The other thing I look at is um, clinical effectiveness. Now, is the patient going to get better with this, or are they not going to get better? And if not, how do we make it better? So I get paid to look at these cases, render my decisions based on uh, those two criteria and, the, and everything that's embedded inside of the Centene um, criteria program. Um, I also am looking at ways to create um, criteria to make things more efficient. So when they say government is big, I would agree. If they say they want to drown government in a bathtub, let's do it. But let's not, let's not get rid of efficiency. Let's, not put, let's put all of the right people, the most brilliant minds in the world, at the top of the podium. And let's let them be efficient. And let's let them, I, I, I don't know, you guys probably know Robert Moses, the guy. Um, I always use this guy because I read Power Broker and this book kind of changed my life. But Robert Moses, kind of the architect of current New York and all of the boroughs, he did that. He looked at a bureaucratic mess and he combined departments. He made things more efficiently, more efficient. So every, every dollar that was spent on taxes was good. Um, but the thing is, is, you know, big government is good when companies make money. So right now we're about to see the government is about to give, I, 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 I don't have a, an actual number, but they're about to give anywhere from three to five trillion dollars to the new industry, which is my industry. That's free money. They had to do almost nothing to get this. So why wouldn't they want that? They want it. So is, for every person that uh, Ted Cruz is being bought and, bought and sold to, there are about three or four people that stand to get that money transferred into their bank account. That would be the CEOs that are part of my industry. So we're seeing this tug of war happen. Um, the fact is, is that the, the companies that I work for stand to invest, their investment is about to be a lot more than the people that are stand to lose lose from it. We're going to start to see jobs open up in the, the healthcare field. In my in my sector alone, we're going to see 600 new pharmacist jobs. 600. That's insane. Underneath that, I've talked to a lot of my friends who are doctors, nurses, and other pharmacists. Their biggest fear right now is that they don't have the infrastructure put into place to handle all of the people that are coming in. This makes sense. What an insurance company does is they bundle all of your money together for market share. And then they go ahead and they go onto the market and then the market decides what the best price is and they bid on that. Um, that's awesome. That's, re that's really amazing because that's how it should work. Um, the fact is, is if everybody does have to pay in the system, that is on average going to reduce premiums from on average $900 per month, uh, sorry, per year down to $600 per year. That's amazing. Now, a lot of people are upset because the cost is going to be upfront because that's called an investment. Um, when, when, when Roosevelt invested in our country after the, you know, after the Great Depression, no one complained about that. If you talk to someone that lived through the Great Depression, they wouldn't say big government was bad because people were living like it was the Middle Ages. And we as a people invested in our people. So what I think we're going to see happen in the next five years is we're going to see us rally around us. We're going to see us invest in us. Texas is 47th in the nation for education. Rick Perry took five billion dollars out of the budget. Um, that's not right. We need to invest in our children. Who's going to take these jobs if our children aren't educated correctly? So if we look at what's going to happen and the amount of hiring hospitals need to do and the training that needs to take place in order to fulfill these spots in the next year to five years, it's a, it's a train wreck. But I've worked for corporations for a long time. I've also been an executive team lead of Target Pharmacy for a really long time. And, and, a, and a corporation's model isn't, isn't let's quibble about, you know, the, you know, let's not quibble about the, you know, the details of it. Let's go ahead and implement a vision for the future and then we'll work out the details as we go. And Target is a very efficient company. So when Target does something like this, they're looking at what's in it for them. So they're going to invest a lot now in us. We're probably going to pay a lot now in the, in the short run. But as we start to get better, we're going to start to pay less. And the incentive is going to be similar to that of a car. If you take your car in every three to 5,000 miles and get it checked, then it's going to be okay. With our system, you're probably going to get money. 
And what they're going to do is they're going to look at your business metrics. They're going to look at your blood pressure. They're going to look at your heart rate. They're going to look at your diabetes um, you know, risk factors. They're going to look at your risk factors for high cholesterol. And they're going to take a look at those. And we're going to have to go to the doctor once every six months or to a year, depending on your age, depending on your risk brackets. And as you start to get healthier, your premium is going to start to drop. So now we have an economic incentive. If you want to pay more, then you can be unhealthy. But you know what? As a taxpayer, we're not going to incentivize that. You are going to pay more for that. But if you're getting better and we see the progress, your, your discounts are going to start to add up. So we are, we're going to start to think long term. Right now we have, and I think the exact quote is, is our current system is get hooked on our drugs and kill yourself, but we don't care about the long term uh, you know, possibilities for you instead of uh, we want to do preventative care. So we want to look ahead. We want to look at what your family predispositions are. Are you, predis are you a predisposition for having diabetes? Are you a, do you have a predisposition for having Alzheimer's? If you are, then let's take the correct steps right now so that later on down the line we can get it figured out. So that's what we're moving from. We're moving from this, this huge system that's unsustainable, that can't function on its own, that's very top heavy, and at any moment can collapse, because the stock market knows that it's about to collapse. Everything that they have invested is based on a veneer of, of, of a, not a foundation. There's no foundation there. It's based on what can happen tomorrow or in, within the next day. You know, if there's a tragedy in Benghazi or if something happens in Libya, then I might make some money off of gold. We'll use big hedge funds. We'll use our 401ks. We'll risk your future for our short-term gain. But with Obamacare, it's going to start to have long-term solutions to a lot of these vexing um, situations in an attempt to make our lives better and more efficient. That's the overall look. Uh, that's the way I see things playing out, and that's the way the bill is, is outlined. It's, it's, it's outlined for efficiency. It's outlined for short-term uh, short highs, but long-term investment, an investment on each other. And, and I think that you know if everyone's paying in and our prices go down, then I think that's good. A lot of people are scared of this. This is going to be our generation's um, Roosevelt moment. It's going to be our generation's you know, Great Depression era uh, moment. This is when we decide if we're going to exist as a United States longer than Rome was an, a, an empire. You know, this is when we decide. And as a people, we should all stand up and we should have this conversation and we should have it appropriately. We shouldn't. We shouldn't be scared or threatened into a certain in a certain situation. We should actually talk about it because the details in the bill are is as they were. Um, I heard Ted Cruz talking about the fact that this is hurting people and that. Um, People are paying more, and it's just not true. Um, there's no evidence to back that um, at all. If people are paying more, then they're paying more. Um, what we need to do is shift the burden of pay from the middle class to the 1%, because those are the people that don't make the economy move. Those are the people that sit on their investments and watch it get bigger. What we need to do is we need to take that money, we need to put it back into each other, and watch that grow. Um, and the middle class, that is the class that makes money move. That is the class that makes business move. Though that is the class of people that, that builds things. It isn't, it isn't Mitt Romney, it isn't CEOs. They don't build anything. Uh, we build it. They just uh, get all the credit for it. Um, but that's kind of all I have. I wanted to make it as short as possible. Um, so that I'm not meandering through a whole bunch of information. I, I, I specifically left out statistics. I left out um, any of those things because the broad overview is the most important thing. I had a bunch of statistics, um, but I don't think they're, they're necessary. Um, I'll, uh, I guess it's, it's question time. So, um, but yeah, thank you so much. I, oh, I, I'm so sorry that I made you guys wait, um, but um, I'll go ahead and hand this over. And oh, okay. So the, I guess it's question time. I don't know if uh, we're going to go ahead and hand a mic out. Oh, we got one over here. You got one. <laughs> uh, do you know where we stand as far as health care compared to the other industrial nations or around the world? And do you know who pays the most for health care? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. I wanted to actually get into this, but I didn't want to bog anyone down with any extra information. Um, here's the thing. Germany and I want to say Sweden have 
one of the have some of the most efficient healthcare systems in the nation, and it, they would actually in the world. Sorry, um, they would actually probably be the model for which we'd want to go after because they they have situations and systems um, where they I think they have you know we all know that, that Canada has you know um, the you know when someone gets pregnant they have the leave for the mom and the dad it's good for the baby but they have one of the most efficient healthcare systems where everyone pay into it I don't know the details of it but I, I, I would have to say that I've seen a survey of what the world is doing and we're way way low on there and they usually determine these things based on infant mortality rate and I think that's one of the biggest markers for this we have one of the highest infant mortality rates in the world which is telling us that I don't care how much money we've spent on our on our healthcare system, it's not efficient. If we can't beat um, the next socialized, I don't want to use that word because people get scared of it. But the the next system that that offers healthcare universally to everybody, if we can't beat them with all the money that we put into it, then we're doing something wrong because they have a much lower infant mortality rate than we do. Oh. <laughs> no, no, this is yeah. How are you doing? <laughs> It's good seeing you. I wasn't able to make it on Tuesday, but it's good seeing you again. Um, I wonder if the government would go along with allowing an insurance company to provide a plan whereby their insurees would be able to go abroad and get the same kind of treatment for a fraction of the cost. Right. And um, also, I would like to just make this statement. Were you aware of what Gaddafi had set up for his people in Libya? No, no. Every single citizen in Libya got total health care. No matter where in the world they had to be sent, the government paid room board tuition, medical expenses, and the family can go with them. Government wow. paid it all. Wow. And, and what did that look like? How did that, what was the feel, like what's the feel of the general I mean, because I think you, you start to trade freedom for, you know, other things when you start to, you know, distribute too much, redistribute too much. Well, they had an oil industry and Gaddafi was pouring that back into the country. He, he made a statement that no member of his family would own a private home until all of you citizens own a private home. And his oh. father passed away without owning a private home. Wow, that's... And the same was true of education. Any education anybody wanted anywhere in the world, mm -hmm. to whatever extent they wanted it. They love that man dearly. Right. Well, you know, it reminds me, you know, they say Hugo Chavez is this evil devil man, but he was really battling uh, oil interests there. Um, he really was. And I think that is the biggest war, uh, governments and industry. Because I know out there they, they really, they ran the coup, they did all of that stuff, but is, did, in Libya, did, were they, was that the same sort of situation where you saw the oil industry trying to rise up against that? Because you're obviously you're going to get the one percent elite always backing away from this whole idea of risk redistribution. Um, I think the oil industry there was pretty much controlled by the government, mm. and Gaddafi's government pretty much figured that this belongs to the people. Right. And uh, I mean, women in Libya had equal rights of men. They drove their own cars. They could go to the top of any company they wanted right. to. The, there, there's no way there could have been a revolution. And the only way that they had that war was the CIA paid Al-Qaeda and armed them to come in and destroy Libya. Right. And the reason for that was that Gaddafi was trying to get various African nations to join him right. in a single currency that was gold-backed. Mm -hmm. And the most powerful cartel, the most evil cartel on earth, mm -hmm. is the international banking system of which the, Fe of which the Federal Reserve right. is part. Okay, I, I, we've talked about this and I completely agree. I wanna take it back to healthcare though. Um, in terms of what you were talking about, um, the abroad movement and also uh, the lowering of the price, I don't know how that figures into any of this stuff um, because I would think that if we're going to invest in ourselves, we would want to make sure that the money stays here um, and not kind of open that market to too much. Um, I would think that c having a closed border system might actually be more beneficial to us because it, it, it'll keep the generation of jobs and money here um, but go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, in response to that, there's, mm -hmm. there's one thing. Okay. The pharmaceutical industry drives the healthcare industry. They have Congress totally bought off. It doesn't make any difference what the party is. They're one of the most powerful cartels on earth and they're ruthless. No, I agree. Um, I like how you Every, use, oh, go ahead. 
every pharmaceutical drug, and now this was a, a, a retiree from a major position in the pharmaceutical industry who was being interviewed one night, mm -hmm. and this was recorded until they pulled the interview off the air. Right. But he stated that every drug is designed only to mask the symptoms of the disease, not to cure it, because it would put them out of billions of dollars of business if they cured the disease. Secondly, every pharmaceutical drug that you take has other chemicals in it, and if you take that drug consistently for a period of time, you will develop, quote unquote, another disease mm -hmm. for which they have another drug and another and another, mm -hmm. and that's why older people are on so many drugs now. These mm -hmm. people are criminals. No. I think that competition of being able to go abroad might be good for this industry. Right. I, I, I see that. Um, I like how you use the word cartel because they are a cartel. And, and the thing is, is we don't, we don't talk enough about what their annual earnings are, but uh, I, the latest thing I read probably a year ago was um, like $23 billion. They're up there. Them and insurance companies are up there and they don't want to give up this money. Um, and, and I think that to your point about uh, opening up the borders for increased competition, I'm not sure what that looks like, but anything that drives competition and forces a company to have to work for that government subsidy is worth it. Um, and I would love to see more on that. And about the whole body perspective of medicine, you're absolutely right. Um, stuff for osteoporosis, I don't know if anyone's on. Uh, Elandronate or Boniva or um, any one of those, Mykelson, all those medicines for, for uh, osteoporosis, um, you should really only be on those for a max of about five years because it can lead to broken jaw, can lead to broken hip, and all of those things in increase mortality rates. So yes, there should be a time, a time frame and that's what we do. My job, we, we, we look at those things. We look at how long have you been on this? Um, you know, for medicines that are super expensive, I've had a couple of cases where we had an HIV patient or uh, I had another case where someone had a bone marrow transplant and uh, you know, after you get the bone marrow transplant, your immune system goes to nothing. So you need to be on other medicines, uh, fungal, antifungal prophylaxis to prevent from fungal infections, just stuff floating around in the air and also antibacterials. Well, well, some of these antifungals will cost, I, I, I'm not, this is a real number, $42,000 a month for these medicines. And some doctors want to prescribe it for six months. Uh, my job is to look at the clinical literature and, and take a look at this. Uh, for one, a bone marrow transplant, you're only going to be, um, your immune system's only going to be um, depleted for one month. Um, so you don't need six months of therapy. You know, otherwise, if no one looked at this, if drug companies had it their way, yes, pay 40000 a month for six months, boom, because they're going out and doctors don't have time to review any of the literature. I do. I sit and that's all I do. I look at the literature. I see what's out there, what's consistent, what things you need to, to view. So what things do you need to monitor? We're monitoring white blood cell count. We're watching, you know, stuff like that. So as those things start to rise, you start to decrease the amount of the drug. For bone marrow transplants, a month is about the max. The patient had had the bone marrow transplant eight months ago. There was no need for the patient to be on this, but the doctor wanted to give it anyway. So I went ahead and had to have the talk with the doctors and oncologists. They know their stuff. So the conversations with them are usually really good, but that is uh, six times four. That's, you know, that's $240,000 of tax money that could have potentially gone to waste if someone wasn't reviewing that. Um, this, this is Medicaid now. This is a government program. Um, the uh, Affordable Health Care Act that comes in is going to have the same premise. And our company is gearing up. We're poised to make a certain billion. I can't even disclose this information because uh, then it would be considered inside trading and everyone would go out and buy stock, blah, blah, blah. But they're geared to make billions of dollars within the next five to ten years on, in the industry as a whole, five to ten trillion dollars. So that's, that's real money. That's real investment. You know. Okay, I'll go ahead and take uh, more questions now. Do you see the future of the health care carriers such as Blue Cross, United, you know? Yeah, that's a good question. All of them. <laughs> okay, I can tell you the, 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 the insurance companies that aren't efficient, and I'm going to tell you they're going to have to make major overhauls because if they don't get it together, they're going to get out competed. Um, Molina is a good company. U.S. Scripps and Teens is a pretty good company. CVS Caremark? Very crooked. Very bad. Uh, discriminatory practices. Uh, you know, I don't want to defame anything or be bad about that, but, but my, my look on that is that companies like these will get weeded out because they will not be efficient. They will not be getting our money if they're not doing the right thing. So I see it being a lot better, a lot more efficient, and weeding out the companies that are, are, that are 
um, suckling at the you know the you know the teat, if you will, of um, you know taxpayer money and also um, just uh, the fact that they set their own prices. Uh, okay. Um, I don't know what the initial cost is. I just know what they, they, they so every, every business company tends to have a, a projection of what they tend to make. And so as an industry, the five to 10 trillion is extra money. That's, that's profit. Yeah. That's, that's after everything's paid money. What I really want to know is who stands to make the biggest, most oh. ludicrously exorbitant windfall excess profit off this whole, mm -hmm. I want to say mess, but you seem to like it, thing right. up front, the right. pharmaceutical companies or all the insurance companies, who stands to ma make the hugest, largest, ludicrously mm. ridiculous, exorbitant windfall profit right. up front? Okay, so this is something that we have to weed out slowly. Um, it's going to be CEOs because they always make the most money. The CEO get, takes their money off of the top. So they are going to, they set their own, you know, they set their own uh, wage. They set their own amount. They set everything. They do everything that they want to do. They have way too much power. So the CEO for sure is going to make the most money of these companies. Um, with time and as we start to change and start to look at the facts and start to elect or start to get out and vote and start to get the wrong, start to get the, the you know, the wrong people, the extremists, the special interests out of office, we'll start to see regulation. You know, people look at, look at regulation as a bad thing. Regulation stopped us from uh, a stock market crash up until it was deregulated again and right around, you know, I don't want to name presidencies, but right around the 80s, 90s, and currently. So once we start to instill those things back into us, into the system, there will be caps on who makes money. And the exorbitance and all the extra money will actually become more efficient and put back into the system to where that your tax dollar is now going further than it did before. And that's okay. You know, I'm for taxes. If I don't live in, you know, a third world country where gorillas are running around shooting up people, I'm okay paying 35% of my tax dollars. It's worth it to me. So what I want to do is get rid of big government and instill efficient government. Um, and definitely CEOs make the most. Okay. Okay, I might have a misunderstanding here. Okay. Um, uh, what if, uh, if I understand there's caps on uh, the uh, Affordable Care Act on how much you can have to pay as far right. as a premium. What if I find out that the uh, cap, uh, the, the, the percentage is better with Obamacare than it is Medicaid? Can I uh, take, can I choose? Um, not necessarily. You know, there's always going to be um, sort of a criteria that you'll have to meet. It's usually based on income and it's usually based on what your employer has offered you. So a lot of times what I see is that if your employer, so if you have two working, uh, you know, um, uh, two two adults in a relationship that are both working currently, uh, most plans will, um, they will default giving coverage, added coverage, in lieu of, of the, the pr you know, the um, primary coverage. But if you wanted to elect to do Medicaid, uh, you, you would have to fit in a certain bracket. And if you're in that bracket, you're in. But the, the, um, the I guess the uh, criteria for getting in is so stringent that you have to be amongst the poorest of the poor. If you're, it, it, basically there's this threshold value that if you're above that threshold and slightly below it, um, from there to middle class, you're, you're, you're the worst off. You have the worst, I mean, I don't know what that, what that, um, that price range is, but if you're there, you have the worst. The poorest of the poor tend to have a little bit better, but it's not a, it's not a vacation. It's not, it's not like Reagan calling, you know, women, uh, you know, welfare queens and, and, you know, swimming in pools and, and this fantastic world. It just doesn't exist if you're on welfare. My, it didn't for me. My mom was on welfare. Um, and our world, our, our house was caving in. Um, and there was such a stigmatism put on, you know, welfare or not, that people were scared to even say they were on it. People, people despite having the option to do this, felt like they were going to get discriminated against if they used it, and my mom was one of them. We went without electricity. We went without heat. We went without running water for, for time periods unknown. Um, you know, our, our roof was caving in, but it was because of the stigma. She was raised in a, uh, my grandpa was a Nixonian Republican, and he didn't like freeloaders, and he didn't like anyone messing with his tax money. So my mom purposely, who raised me independent, by the way, purposely um, would not you know, would not go on welfare. She felt like she was a bad person. And we need to change that rhetoric 
so that you know what we can do is if everyone is, is using it and using it wisely and getting off of it accordingly then we're actually running you know we're, 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 we're being better as a people and we need to not look down on people that need those services we need to reach out to them and say it's okay if you need those and and, and start to be a community again of people wor working towards a common goal and less of a you know a, a, a cutthroat you know I got to beat you and you have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps or you're poor because you deserve it or you're poor because you don't want money sort of mentality that's that's not how we view it if my family needs help I know that they've worked hard and I'm not going to deny them that help um, and I think that if we looked at it like as in terms of we're all family and, and together in this together then I think we will move forward as, as a people now I'm, I'm part of a different generation the generation that I'm part of and, and I have my brother-in-law with me that's Christie's little brother back there I'm sorry I don't mean to draw attention to him but um, he's part of a different generation and this generation um, she is busy Yes, so she's super busy. Um, I wish she could have come out. Um, she said to tell everyone hi, though, so hello. <laughs> from, that's from Christy. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I was hoping she'd meet us here, um, but she's just, she's got way too much, I, you know. And, and there's a lot of support, so everyone that's helped out with that, I really appreciate it. The election starts November. I didn't even plug it. I didn't even do a shameful, shameless plug. So. The, the early voting election in District 8, um, our area code is 75204, um, starts on the, the 21st of this month and it'll run through the 5th. So um, hopefully, and then again, this is where we're seeing the private companies wanting. Um, it's basically her, uh, Mike Miles' um, secretary is running um, against her, that's her opponent, and they want to instill, um, a, yes, a business model. So what they're going to have is instead of principals, it's going to be like Target, like where I work. They're going to have executive directors. I don't know what the title is, but their salary is going to be about two hundred, three hundred thousand. It's going to be more than the president. And so I'm like, wow. So my tax dollar is going to go right to him. He's going to get his paycheck before our kids get anything. And they already started the process of consolidating um, the schools down to make way for these huge amounts of. of um, profits to go to the CEOs and that was the 13 10 I think it's 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 actually 10 schools of closing so um, so Christy really needs your help because obviously there's big interests there's special interests I, I'll use that term till I'm blue in the face special interests there are so many of them and they're special interests because they're not our interests our interests are us and we have to stand up for our interests and stop worrying about what these companies or these corporations or these quote-unquote special interests care about and if we stand up there's more of us than there are of them one percent versus us oh my god they I hope they I hope they they came prepared because I don't I see a bunch of fighters in here and I know that that I my wife is and I know that I am and I will I will fight and hopefully make um, this world better than what I came into and hopefully we'll continue on that up and up pathway it's just that we seem about 20 30 years of, of time will pass and we seem to forget what happened and it, they love it. They love that that happens because then the cycle begins again. And then we start seeing the same deregulation, the same blah, 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 the same crashes. Um, I wanted to present the case to you in terms of, uh, of uh, dynamic systems. And I wanted to use chaos theory and all this stuff. But when I got up here, really, I don't need to talk fancy like that. I just need to talk. And um, that's just kind of how I see it. I mean, is there, any, is there anything else that, OK. All right. All right. On the subject of. Um, mm -hmm executive salaries mm -hmm. in the insurance industry and in the operators of the healthcare places um, it is very high I agree with that the numbers are very large of course if you compare that to non-healthcare industries of the same size who generate the same amount of revenue they have the same number of employees it's not unusual in other right. words, the salaries in a lot of those jobs is not much different than it would be in a major oil company or General Electric, mm -hmm. General Motors, right. or large corporate employers. So I don't like those numbers when I see them. I gag, you know. Right. They're it's very wrong. high. Mm -hmm. But the other thing you have to look at when you, when you make that case is how much is the total health care cost in the United States? That's a good question. Well, you don't know. Yes. <laughs> and do you know how much the top executive of all those big companies make? 
No. You don't know? I don't. So you don't have an argument okay. that has any economic basis. And my position is, mm -hmm. if you cut all of their salaries in half, more. And, you, and you divided that across all the health care costs to reduce it, right. it would be pennies. Right. No, I, it would be trivia and significant. It's an irritant to us to mm -hmm. see somebody get a job that pays $478,000 a year, mm -hmm. and we think it might ought to be worth $200,000 a year. Less. Less. <laughs> but the fact is, emotion is not what really causes things to happen. Mm -hmm. It's reality. And right. reality is, if you don't pay those people enough money, you're going to lose them and the system will suffer because of it. Right. But it probably should be capped in some way. I don't have any personal disagreement with that. Mm -hmm. But I don't agree with the position mm -hmm. that it is as excessive as we politically try to make it. Right. Okay, point two. The top 1% mm -hmm. are the creators of the wealth in this country. They're mm -hmm. the creators of the jobs in this country. Right. They pay between three and four times their share of the income taxes and all the taxes. If you, li if you listen to uh, one of the talk people on the radio who happens to work in New York City, their total tax rate is 54%. Mm -hmm. That's not really very low. And so people who make a good bit of money pay a lot of money. Right now, the bottom 48% of the population pay no income tax. Okay, um, I'm going to go. So the point, my point is this. It's, a que it's not a question. I forgot right, right. your pardon. My question is, mm -hmm. if, do you have any idea mm -hmm. if you reduce the income of the top 1% by 50%, Mm -hmm. How much would that amount to for the rest of the population, all 310 million right. of us? Okay. Is it significant or mm -hmm. is it just an emotional thing to right. say, we feel like they're screwing us and we're going to get right, the money right. back? No, you, that, that was all good stuff. I'm going to bring out all of, I'm going to talk to all of those points there. Um, the first couple is about the cost and what they make. And there are no, there are, we don't know what the market is. They haven't had a market. So the only reason why we have prices where we have them is because we've allowed the market to adjust for that. So the price of a car, the price of the house. But we don't know what the real numbers are on the price of medicines or the price of healthcare. We don't know because we haven't had a market that's, that's been open to allow us to set those prices. You know, uh, here in Texas, a three bedroom house, 3,500 square foot, $250,000. HIV medicines, cancer medicines, right now their market says per year, millions of dollars based on that so we don't know what those costs are we will find out though once the market opens up we'll be able to single it out now point two you said 55 percent um okay uh, after they get through all of their loopholes and everything else the average um income the average uh tax rate for the wealthy is about 35 percent it's actually it actually steadily dropped from around Roosevelt's time from about 90% and it's been on the steady decrease to about Reagan who dropped it from 50 down to 40% something close to that I don't quote me on that and then under uh, you know under uh, Clinton it dropped down to 40 37% with Obama it stayed at 35% through both of his presidencies Obama has not decreased the average um, tax rate on the wealthiest of us, uh, the wealthy of, uh, of the Americans. They still on average pay 35%. So 55%, that's not, that's not totally accurate because if you divide it and average it up amongst the 1%, it averages out to about 35%. Hopefully we get that umber, number up and once that starts to rise and the market starts to open, we'll start to see what the true numbers of everything are and we'll start to um, uh, spread the money out. Uh, uh, an economy in gridlock doesn't work and it's it's because the, the really rich they really don't buy any I mean they it's like nothing to them it's like you know a, a hundred thousand a million dollars is like a dollar so let's get them to spend their money you know and uh, okay I guess it, uh, I guess we have another question another question yeah. oh there hold on question we gotta leave time for rebuttals you know that yeah <laughs> I'm sure there's not any, but do you see any possibility 
of an effort to get alternative medicine an equal footing with the pharmaceutical industry because there are so many natural cures out there that mm -hmm. actually work without any so-called side effects, i.e. poisoning symptoms. Is right. there any real effort to do this? I know the UN is trying to do the opposite, mm -hmm. to stamp it all out. Um, right. Any feedback on that? Um, no. I, well, yeah, I actually have a lot of feedback on that. No, I totally agree. Natural medicines are the way to go. We haven't explored that enough because, well, there's a number of reasons, always industry. Uh, the second, one of the second biggest markets is the quote unquote natural medicine free market. They own a huge lobbying degree. They probably make as much, slightly less than the actual drug companies. So these are the companies that bring you Sao Palmetto. These are the companies that bring you Estrovin. These are the companies that bring you um, any other type of um, alternative type of medicine. They don't want this stuff to be studied because if it gets studied, we figure out what the active ingredient is, then they're not going to own this market anymore. And it's going to become a market that the drug company owns. So they have a lot of money. They put a lot of money into the stake that says, we don't want you to study our products. We don't want you to study any of this. Like, for instance, aspirin was part of uh, white willow bark. And uh, uh, they studied it, and they figured out that the active ingredient of it was the actual acetosilic acid, which is the aspirin molecule. So if we start to study more of those things than these natural drug companies, are not gonna like that. So we have to fight that. I hope we do because you're right. There's a lot of potential in a lot of natural medicines. I'm a total believer in that. There just isn't any studying of that. Um, you also talked, let me see. Yes, yeah, so you also talked about from other countries. So this is the biggest racket. What, what the drug companies do is they go ahead and they give um, medicines. What they do is they try to, um, they try to decrease the prices um, based on the market of other countries. So like for Africa, South Africa, they're, they have epidemics of HIV in the numbers. They have uh, yellow fever issues. There's drugs that, that treat that, uh, mefloquine, av uh, you know, etobicone, and then all of your HIV medicines. Um, they will sell that to them at 20% of what we get, and then if that money, if those drugs get reimported back to, into the United States, it jumps up to 150, 200%. Um, it's ridiculous. No, we, we should have, uh, I think, a recycling program. The recycling program should allow unused medicines to be checked and verified by the FDA um, and then put back into the system because that would save a lot of money. Think about if it went out for 20%, it came back in, you buy it at 10%. You know, oh God, yeah, that would be awesome. I wish we would do that. I like, I think, thanks for bringing that out. That's, that's, that really is an interesting point. I wish they would do that. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? That's it. Oh, I got another question. All right. I believe it's a pretty well-known established fact that anything having to do with hospitals, mm -hmm. health care, medicines, uh, salaries and wages to nurses, mm -hmm. nurse assistants has been allowed for probably the last 30 years, at least if not longer, to escalate at a higher percentage rate than the regular overall rate of inflation. So now we're paying through the nose, so to speak, for anything having to do with health care. Right. Because that was allowed and permitted to happen. Right. Which should never have been allowed to happen in the first place. Right. What is the average percentage above the rate of inflation? Anything having to do with health care has been allowed to mm. uh, escalate uh, more than the, the, the overall rate of inflation. Um, and, well, here's the thing. So I actually wanted to talk about that. Is I, I term it the... Uh, the hospital industrial complex. And the reason why I term it this way is because doctors' salaries have been at a steady decrease over the past 20 years, while CEOs' proportional, proportional income has increased uh, similarly. So as doctors' um, a average salary has gone uh, way low, CEOs have been shoveling that money into their pocket. Um, private hospitals do the same thing. So doctors are extremely stressed out. They're very stressed out with Medicaid. They're very stressed out with government because they're, they're not getting paid anything. They go to school for all these years. Um, if you're, my personal thing is, is I do it because I love it. I, I would do my job. I get paid a pretty handsome sum for it, probably more than I should get. But I, if I had the choice, I would do it for 35000 a year. I don't care um, about cost. I do it because I enjoy it. Um, doctors that go, and you know, there's a huge profit. There's this whole... Um, notion that if you make it, you know, if you give, like with CEOs, if you give them this huge economic incentive, you're going to drive the best of the best. That's not true. What you're going to drive is the greediest of the greedy. So they're going to do that job only because they can do it. They're not going to do it because they enjoy it. 
You know, doctors really should make a connection with their patients. And when I'm, when I'm with a patient or I'm doing my job, I try to make that connection because I actually enjoy what I do. Um, what you need to do is probably, I don't, I, wanna, I don't wanna say drop it, but what I wanna say is keep it static, drop CEO salaries, put that money back into the system and invest in our people, and you will start to see the people that enjoy it and the most intelligent people doing it. And you'll start to see the greediest of the greedy you know, do what they want to do. You know, let them let them go do their thing. They don't need to be operating on me if they don't want to. So, that's a good point. Um, I wish I could have talked about that more, but yeah, I don't I don't know the numbers on like inflation rates and stuff like that. But I know that doctors are getting paid whew, lo a, a huge percentage less than what they used to get paid. Um, but yeah, cool. Er, all right. Oh, well, Ren, I got one question. Then we we'll drop it. Uh, do you think that? Uh, do you see anything ahead for the single payer system? Um, I think that I like the option. I know that they fought hard to put that in, and I actually think that's a good compromise. I think that um, I don't un I don't understand all of the details with the, of what's going on, but um, I know that the single payer um, is is a good option. I think that if you want to take that option, you should go private company because, like I said, pr some private companies just do some things better than um, a government companies, or go, you know, government run. Um, most of the government, um, like Medicaid, is, it, it's contracted out to like my company. So um, we do a pretty good job. I mean, we're a private company taking government subsidies, but the single payer option I think is a great option. If you, if you can't afford it and you don't, you, you know, you can't be in the private system, it's, it's, um, it's probably going to, uh, where's I going? It's probably going to be to your benefit if you have more money, then you get more care. You know, um, you know, Medicaid. Uh, I think we give. Pre I think honestly, our Medicaid patients are treated really nicely because our three biggest goals are quality um, and service and also uh, efficiency. So those are the three big pillars that we that we tend to work on as our overall uh, mission. So yeah, uh, I hope. It, I hope. I don't know what to to make of the single payer right now. So. I think though, yeah. Okay, good. All right. I guess it's uh, cool. Thank you guys. It's really nice to see everyone again. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen. Oh, you get we, yeah. we okay. get we get rebuttals, and then you get to you get to respond to all the comments that are made. Sit down. You get to comment. Okay. So now it's your turn to talk. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. You get you get to expound here for five minutes. Whatever you want to say. Okay. I want to get my ten minutes. <laughs> five minutes. We'll give you five minutes. Just five? Oh, yeah, just five. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for a great, great talk. Now, I did last March, I did a Affordable Care Act presentation here also. And one of the things that was asked and we didn't have, the bill will first cost about one, the law, 1.7 trillion. Uh, just to get it rolling and basically what they're saying here is that's just to get it rolling but the CBO says that the law will reduce the deficit per year by 210 billion and all the crap we've heard from our boy Joe McCarthy alias Ted Cruz is that it's going to bankrupt the country right now we better watch out who the economic terrorists are because they're going to bankrupt the country. Uh, one of the things that, uh, and, and it's also patient, the full name is Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. And right now that uh, money has been given back uh, to a lot of individuals because the companies have basically uh, taken more to put into advertising, et cetera, et cetera. This is the only last part that they're putting in there now. Different places have been affected all the time, like children, uh, if they had a previous condition, are allowed in it. Now, the, this part right now, as we get into 2014, all people will be allowed, if you had a, a previous illness or something, you, you will have to be covered. And that's very important. Now this is not, people say government is into it. Uh, government has, has set up exchanges. 
The only reason we have the federal government going to set up like an exchange here is because we had a governor that says, I refuse to take Medicare, I will not Medicaid, I will not support this in any way, shape, or form, and his group of thugs. And as far as I'm concerned, the ones that are, have their own exchanges, is working very well. And I do, ha I do have a theory here that the company that has put in uh, for the, the, uh, the thing of setting up where you can go in and get on the exchanges and so forth is a Canadian company. Now, Ted's from Canada. Do you see any connection here? Or am I just being foolish? Yeah, Canadian Cuban. And, and the thing is that uh, what this is is not a government run program. It is a partnership between the government and private industry. It's, we are set up much like the Swiss set their national health care up. I myself think a single payer would be the way to go, but there would have been no way to get that through our Congress whatsoever. And so anyway, uh, uh, what it is now is uh, that, uh, and I, I'd like to make a few other things. Uh, the U.S. is ranked number 37 of the countries in health care, okay? U.S. Yes. U.S. Uh, the, the cost for the people in the United States were number one in cost. The curve has to be built, uh, bent, and this is happening. The U.S. is 43. This was information I got last March. Is number 43 of industrial nations and, and countries in infant mortality rate. I think this is a crying shame because they do not give the preventative care ahead of time. Uh, I, I was over in New Zealand and they have uh, prenatal care for all. Afterwards, they have care for everyone also. So uh, the thing is that what, what we have to do, now, now why was this thing so politicized? because there's a lot of people that lie a lot. Lie a hell of a lot. If this system is not going to work and the affordable health care will not work in this country, let it fall by itself. We don't need to shut the government down, put a gun to the head of the people and say we will not pay our debts until you end the Affordable Care Act. This is utterly ridiculous. And I hope people realize that. Realize of what Ted Cruz and the gang of congressmen have done to us. And we remember this election time. Because we can change things. I know a lot of people feel we can change things. I'm an optimist. I believe we can. And, and we're going to turn this state into something we can be proud of regardless of Rick Perry and the rest of the thugs. Thank you. Okay, who wants to be next? Who has to be next? Al Holman. I knew you would be up here, Al. <laughs> You have five minutes, Al. Everybody's been telling me that. <laughs> <laughs> Is there some perceived problem here? <laughs> I think if there's anything that we need to, as Americans, think about and is this. You cannot trust anybody in government. That's why our founding fathers gave us a republic where the population needs to be well educated and needs to be involved and needs to crack the whip because that thing of greed and lust for power always goes to the top of every organization and it's completely infiltrated the United States government. So we need to really get more active and I, I appreciate, George, your, your being active. I really do. And Isaac, I thought that was a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, 
to further illustrate how we cannot trust our government, if you go to the U.S. Patent Office and USPTO and put in the patent number five, let's see, five six seven six nine seven seven, I think it is, you will find the United States patent on the cure for AIDS taken out by the same people who got the patent for AIDS. AIDS is a weapon to reduce worldwide population. Now, that is operating through our government. And incidentally, that cure for AIDS is a silver compound, and I cured one of my cats of feline AIDS with a type of silver, putting it in her mouth and having her drink it. Blood tests before and after the, the uh, veterinarian who does only cats out in Hearst. She said, I've never seen this happen before. This is just wonderful. Completely cured of AIDS. This same fluid has uh, been curing humans of AIDS. It cured one woman of MS. She'd been wheelchair bound. Two months later, she called the fellow who makes the stuff walking in the surf in California. She called him on her cell phone. Uh, there are these things out there. Silver, silver solutions of certain types are marvelous what they can do for us. Uh, they, they do not cause the mutations of these diseases into the things we have in the hospital now that they, like MRSA, that they virtually don't have any, any cure for. We'll try silver. It'll, it'll kill it. It'll kill MRSA. It's done it. Uh, one fellow was having his chest eaten away and silver was put in there, silver solution and it, it cured it completely. Uh, if anybody has a friend with AIDS or whatever, by word of mouth, I'm willing to see that they get the stuff uh, because I know the type that has been done. It, it, it's a little different than colloidal silver. It, it tends to cluster oxygen around the silver atoms and these go into the cell wall and if anybody knows anything about oxygen, oxygenation, that will cure almost any disease, <clears throat> is to oxygenate that cell. And it has to do with whether it's as acidic or alkaline, positive or negative electricity. Uh, Otto Warburg in the 30s uh, found out and got the Nobel Peace Prize for finding out that uh, cell structures that become acidic become cancerous. And if you can change the pH to alkaline, all the diseases leave. All the diseases we have are as simple as termites. They will only eat dead wood. And when diseases come along, it's because we have rendered our bodies through taking in toxins and through eating meals like we ate tonight and <laughs> processed foods instead of natural raw foods where we get the nutrients we need, we have rendered our bodies unfit to continue to be used and the bugs come along and say, well, it needs to be thrown back in the ground for fertilizer for the next generation. That's how nature works. If you clean up the body, all these things leave. Uh, I would strongly recommend anyone to go look into the natural cures of different things. Uh, there's so many cures. I'd, I've got a list on a computer at home of 18 known cures for cancer. Uh, there's one, uh, if you go to a Libris Books, you can get a book called the Bruce, B-R-E-U-S-S, -S, Cancer Cure. In the back of it, it lists where you can get all the ingredients. He cured in his institute, it was either in uh, Switzerland or Germany, I think it was Germany, he cured over 42,000 people of cancer, cured them completely. And in his book he says that leukemia is not even a cancer and it's really, really easy to cure. So here we have an industry that makes so much money out of all of these treatments where they manage your disease, of course they want to manage it for the, as long as they can extend out the payments they get from you, no matter how much you suffer. You bet. Anyway, uh, five, six, seven, six, nine, seven, seven, U.S. Patent Office, if you don't believe it, just go look it up. Five, six, seven, six, nine, seven, seven. I believe that is the one. And that, I mean, doesn't that say something about the society in which we live, that there is the patent? in the United States Patent Office for the cure of AIDS and the patent for AIDS. I was told in 1974 by a CIA agent that World War III would be in the 80s, it would not be nuclear, it would be biological, it would be made to appear to be the natural outbreak of a disease. 
and the purpose was to eliminate black Africa and the subcontinent in India, he was talking about AIDS. That large breakout of AIDS in Africa happened in a region shortly after the, the World Health Organization was inocula inoculating people extensively in that area for various other diseases. And they also administered to a group in Haiti and homosexuals on both coasts of the United States and it is a weapon and it is mass murder and our government's up to its ears in it. We need to watchdog the heck out of our government because they're full of criminals. Next. There'll be a next. There's always a next. <clears throat> well, then, then we run out of people to talk. You're going to, you know? It has to be a next. Susan, are you going to say something? No? <clears throat> well, anyway. I guess we're, well, I will. Anyway, uh, I'm the last man standing. I'll have to say something. I don't know what. I think that if we look ahead of our... I, well, the reason I asked that question earlier about the single payer is that that is the most efficient system. That is the better system that we have. We have the most expensive system in the world, the healthcare system, because it's, it's the most expensive. But, and people are complaining about it. But it's better than no system better than what we didn't have. So that's why I'm for it. But I think down the road it may evolve into a single payer system. And that would be a more efficient, Canada has a single payer. Uh, they have a more efficient system than we do. I think it's $6,000 per patient per year, something like that. We're about three times that. So uh, it's not a good thing in that sense. But it may evolve into that over time. Anyway, uh, I, got, I have to quit and give this back to our speaker, and uh, he gets to come in and come in and close this meeting. You get the last word. Okay, so I'm a geek about drugs, and I can talk with you all night about this. Um, I want to start where he left off, and that is the single pair thing. Um, it didn't click in my brain at the time that the initial question was asked, because sometimes my brain shuts down, but I, I think the single pair. Um, plan is the best plan. I think it's the most efficient plan and I think that it's the most fair plan because what it does is instead of that stratification amongst you know these different um, economic groups you start to see everyone is equal the same. Why wouldn't everyone want the same? If that's the case then our poorest among us will be treated as well as the richest amongst, among us, and that's the fair treatment. Um, so yes, I agree. I'm sorry, I, I didn't have, I, you know, at the time I was confused by single payer and, and um, the, the uh, other option with that. But, um, okay, about the drug stuff, awesome, yes. Um, silver, um, they use it in um, infants when they're first born, eye drops to prevent syphilis, which can happen. Um, also, it's used for, it's in cancer products um, to, as a, chemo, a chemotherapeutic agent and in MS it's also used. Um, gold is also used um, in products for cancer. So yes, exactly, free radicals. You're talking about oxidation, and oxidation, uh, like if you smoke or if you do anything, uh, fatty products, which are complex molecules, um, they, are, they, they become the final electron acceptor instead of oxygen, which is very dangerous. It's one of the most dangerous substances, but it's used to power up all of our systems. Um, Oxygen-free radicals is how our body deals with the immediate, um, uh, so when we, we cut ourselves or we have some Im the inflammatory response, our body sets up a free radical system in which our white blood cells will actually go to that area and use oxygen as the final electron acceptor to split the oxygen. It's called oxidation and it passes that electron onto the microorganism and it kills them. So I love that stuff. I love infectious disease. No, I don't love infectious diseases. I just, I can talk about it a lot. Um, but uh, yeah, US ranked 37th. Uh, yeah, those are all really good. New Zealand is one of the best. I think New Zealand and I think Swi uh, Swi Swi the Swiss system and the German system, I think they're tied up at the top. I'm not sure how those actually pan out, but yes, I agree. If we could shoot for a model, it'd be for one of those ones, and I believe for single payer would be the most fair to everybody. And, you know, just because you're rich, you shouldn't get special treatment, except for, you know, unless you're George Bush and your father's a president, then apparently you could be the president and still be a yell dropout. But, um, what else? Uh, so I think that's about it. I think we covered a lot of stuff.
um, in this, and I, I, I could talk about this all day. I mean, I do it all day anyway, so I think it's all about education, and it's, it's we need to get rid of the fear tactics and the lies. I heard liar, and I heard economic terrorist. I think that's absolutely correct. I think as Hitler was those, I think Ted Cruz embodies those things because Hitler is only a great man because he did horrible things to people. He was actually an idiot, and when he fell, and then, and, you know, Ted Cruz is an idiot. So let's get rid of him and let's get rid of any uh you know tea party okay your tea party yeah last week i misspoke and i said i used a bad misnomer for it for the tea party um this is what i think is happening i think that we're starting to see um people not like the republic the two parties that exist right now and so i see i think we we're seeing people gravitate towards what they agree most with and so we have we have a cer certain age group and we have you know the 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 majority the the white male um older gentlemen um, and I, I think we see them trying to identify with other uh, people in that category, just like we see Hispanic people tend to, um, they tend to be around people that look like them, and black people, they tend to, to hang around with people that look like them. I think that what happened was is this whole quote-unquote grassroots program started by the Koch brothers, um, created this thing, and um, if you looked a certain way, you tended to be on that sort of not radical bandwagon, but that whole third party bandwagon, which happened to be this, this, this tea party. And I think a lot of people just did it because that's what they felt like um, it, it looked like, it mimicked them the most. But I think that what we're seeing is that their policies are horribly destructive and that the economic terrorism that they can impose on our, our, our country and our government is tremendous because we had one guy um, a couple guys, Mitch McConnell was up there, you know, there was a couple of other ones, you know, that, that hurt us so bad, more than they helped us, and, and now, you know, we have another potential crisis on our hands. We, we, we see growth has been stifled, and, and we do need to watch our, our Congress people, and we do need to be involved, and we need to make ourselves involved, and if they don't listen to us, we need to talk to them. Because the thing was, is I, uh, I wanted to talk about Obamacare, and I wanted to talk about how we can strengthen it, and what would make this so. What makes this so is talking to our, uh, you know, and I did, I tried to call Ted Cruz, I tried to call Mitch McConnell, I tried to call Michelle Bachman, and I know people who, you know, when, you know, Ted Cruz was doing his green eggs and ham, you know, filibuster, I know people that uh, <laughs> actually read it to him. So I did call him, and I did, Mitch McConnell, okay, look, they were shut down on that first day. You couldn't even get through any of those um, Congress people. And if you go to my Facebook, I was giving their phone numbers and telling people to call them, and I was telling them what to say. But at Mitch McConnell's office, they actually shut down, and I actually talked to a lady, a staffer, who uh, I told, I said, do you really support this person who's trying to give you different treatment than he's actually giving himself? He doesn't even want you on his health plan. He's trying to make you have a really bad health plan, and you're only getting paid $20,000 a year. Are you seriously? I know you need a job, and at the end of the day, we all have to pay our mortgages. So we have to succumb to you know things that we don't like or situations that we don't want to be in. But you can tell she really didn't believe in what she was doing. She was just trying to get a paycheck, and, and um, we just need to stand up. and and uh, not be afraid not to, 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 you know, to have this conversation because this is a really good conversation and more people need to do it. I wish, I tried to get as many people as I could out here. Um, and at the end of the day, I couldn't even make it on time, so I couldn't expect anybody else to come on time. But I really appreciate it and I, I really enjoyed the talk. And, and, and I'll leave my number and if anyone has any other questions, and uh, feel free to call me, you know. And my wife is awesome, so you know her. Um, and she's doing her thing. We'll, we'll give her a break tonight. But I appreciate everyone. And, I, and it, this happened to be like the worst week of my life but I think it ended up uh, on one of the most positive notes I've had in a while because I think this conversation is super positive and I think also too I want to say something about labor we need to support our labor um, otherwise uh, I, you know I want to bring up a, a topic that right after the you know um, the uh, let's see right after you know right when serfdom happened and we we exited out of the black the dark age we saw that um these monarchies needed uh people to drive their economies and the cost of labor actually went up i mean um, they were willing to pay labor but they still weren't able to give rights to children they weren't able to do any of these things so our our single and only contribution that we have is our labor and if we withhold that labor then we actually uh we actually have power in that. So, you know, when they say boycott or they say walk out and they say do these things, that is our power. Our power is our labor. And if we stand by our labor, then they have to meet us somewhere. So don't be afraid to give up your labor. I mean, I know it's a sacrifice, but I'm willing, I would be willing to do that um, as long as we had um, 
some representation, as long as we passed, you know, reform that allows people not to be used, uh, you know, markets that, uh, yeah, I'm talking too much. But anyways, I, thank you so much. You guys have a great night, and um, I'll give it back to Tom. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. At 10 o'clock, so uh, our speaker, this will be our last meeting at this place, so we're going to go somewhere else next week. I don't know where, but... Uh, right. This is William, your videographer from Two Hats Publishing. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like it, please leave comments below, or like us, or follow us, and get notices to all our videos. Remember, when visiting the Mecca restaurant at the corner of Skillman Avenue and Live Oak, Tell them you want your reservations to the next College of Complexes.